guitar heroes? Um, guitar heroes are just, uh, there's just so many of them, I don't really know where to start. I'll start really when I discovered, um, when I discovered the guitar, it was really Les Paul who I first ever heard, you know, and said, oh, I like that sound. But of course it was such a um, marvellously contrived sound, you know, it was all very well recorded and all this. And uh, it was a whole musical style. So um, when I got into the guitar, I didn't, uh, I didn't know, you know, I couldn't make it sound like Les Paul, <laughs> you know. But at the same time, people were saying to me, look, you know, popular music's all very well, but there's a lot of guitar you could learn from that's outside the, you know, popular music and rock. So this is partly my family, and they, maybe because they didn't want to hear 24 hours of uh, The Shadows and Cliff Richard and all this, they, they, you know, they wanted to change my viewpoint. It's quite healthy, though, um, and initially I heard Django Reinhardt was the first jazz guitarist I heard, and... Um, took me by storm. I mean, I had to, had to listen to this constantly. So Django, and then the great Tal Farlow, who's uh, a legend in his own lifetime. I mean, he's much more a guitarist guitarist, which I think is very unfortunate because, you know, you get the George Bensons and, you know, Wes Montgomery's and fantastic players, but Tal has got uh, very much his own um, approach, uh, harmonically, technically too that um, he's one of the, the fastest guitarists um, that you can hear play. He, but that isn't, it isn't just because he's fast, it's because he's fast and comprehensible, uh, intelligent, melodic, which of course a lot of people aren't, you know. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was, I think, you know, you get these records you see in uh, guitar shots, sometimes done by brilliant guitarists, like Jimmy Bryant is, is, was a wonderfully, uh, advanced guitarist, but occasionally somewhere along their career they do a record like, you know, the fastest guitar in the West or something. And as a guitarist, I can't help but buy it and I put it on and go, oh, God, this is all that little, 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 little. It's all cliche, you know. But um, Speedy West and Jimmy Bryan in their early days, when they used to be a duo, pedal steel and um, guitar were phenomenal. But uh, Really, early days, Rick Nelson's guitarist and later Elvis Presley's guitarist, um, James Burton, was one of the most inspiring guitarists because he was uh, the first one to just use the guitar melodically. This wasn't guitar cliches, you know, like diddly 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 diddly, any of that stuff at all. This was just tunes, really, just like the vocal line played with fantastic expertise. And um, he was with Rick Nelson, who's uh, most probably a lot of people won't know much about him, but of course Elvis did make more of a mark. Um, but and he had the great guitarist Scotty Moore with him originally, who used country picking style, which uh, showed really a great integration that rock music was making. It rock music wasn't a new kind of music; it was a new mixture of of country, a bit of jazz, and uh, and folk and things. God, this sounds awful, and. Um, it came together, and, and Scotty Moore was really a bouncy, bouncy guitarist. You know, it was, it was simple stuff, but played oh, in, in such a wonderful way. But I think the different styles of guitar that I listened to, like I used to like flamenco a lot, people like Sabicus and that, but actually, I really loved it when Paco de Lucia came out, uh, out of Spain, if you like, would be the best way of saying it. He came out of Spain, started making records in Europe. And um, since he's just recently toured with uh, John McLaughlin in the guitar trio that they, they annually tour with. And um, he is in a film called Carmen. Uh, it's the Spanish version of, of the Carmen story, which is really worth going to see. There's not enough guitar in it, obviously, but um, he uh, has done some marvellous records. He'd just done one on compact disc, actually, that's sensational, called Solo. Two words in Spanish. My Spanish is terrible. I won't attempt it. But he, at least, um, is so fresh. And although he's playing flamenco, it's not... Um, it's got a fair bit of stomping and singing going on, but it's not... It's not like, oh, God, turn off the... the, the um, 
castanet player. You know, you don't feel like enclosed in this um, deep ritual of, of uh, Spanish flamenco music. It's much more about today, you know, and that's what's great about Paco de Sia. He's, he's a performer right for now, and you can listen to it. It's got fretless bass and percussionist. You know, it's not a whole lot of people going ding. It's really much more uh, exciting than predictable flamenco. But I would like to just cite, maybe as my last example, a guitarist who's had so much success and yet not so much as a guitarist, and that's George Harrison of the Beatles. I think he did a great deal for, for me and other guitarists in, in the organised rock guitarist, not the blues wailing guitarist or the uh, just guy who improvised all the time, but, but because of the... Um, I suppose restraints that the Beatles put on the musical needs of their group. I mean, they had great songs, they had great singers. You know, what more do you need other than great guitar riffs, which, which uh, George came up with? And they used Gretsch guitars. And besides, you know, the likes of, well, I suppose, Neil Young, um, rockabilly groups, um, Ted Atkins, again. Uh, but besides that, I, it's one of the Eddie Cochran used Gretsch guitars, but, you know, George Harrison used Gretsch guitar. That was the sound of the Beatles to me, was this sort of twangy um, individual sound. It wasn't all Fenders and Gibsons, which were really very recognisable sounds. When you think of, say, U2, I mean, it's very much a Fender sound. Or you, you, uh, you think of um, look, most of the blues guitarists, you know, it's very much a Gibson sort of sound very often. Um, can't generalise too too much without coming unstuck. But um, today, today there's there's it's got to be me, I suppose. It's got to be I've got to get out and do the damn thing all over again. That's what I want to do. I want to bring my music right up to date because I think in a way, 1980 started well, and I think Asia was a good start to the decade, you know. But uh, I definitely want to. Uh, now this is silly. I can't say this. Can't. No, I can't really. You have to, you have to find a way of ending that because it's a dreadful way. I mean, it's really like, hey guys, you know, it's going to be me now. No, I hate that. I am getting a bit hot actually. Not really, no. Um, they, they had records, you know, and we had the traditional sort of 1950s radiogram, you know, this big thing with, with the speaker underneath, and all it went, it was very bassy, you know. So we had a collection of records which ranged from sort of uh, marching tunes, you know, brass bands and things, uh, a bit of Guy Mitchell, and I suppose what I mentioned earlier was Les Paul and Mary Ford records. But uh, before I got on to them, um, I used to find marching bands quite exciting. I mean, much like my nine-year-old does, he loves to leap about to music. Uh, he likes, you know, hip-hop and, you know, scratching and all this, you know, which is quite unusual, I think, for a nine-year-old. But it's healthy. And likewise, I like think anything I could jump about to was, uh, was good fun until, you know, you start wrecking the chairs and wrecking the sofas. And then... Um, the only thing was I had an uncle who, not on my side of the family, on the other side of the family, sort of, who um, played the clarinet. And I used to ask him questions when I was young about this. And at the same time, I took up the guitar. My brother, Philip, who is a film editor in Australia now, he took up the clarinet as well, because he liked traditional jazz. So we had a, a guitar and a clarinet trying to be learned at the same time. And my parents were tearing their hair out, and uh, my brother Phil started get it going off into jazz, uh, modern jazz, I suppose you'd have to call it. And uh, the clarinet didn't really fit, you know, into modern jazz, so he stopped playing. I think, in a way, that was a great thing because it gave me complete freedom. There was only one instrument being learnt in the house. I had the reign of the noise, you know, and the clatter of um, pretending to play things or trying to find out how to play things. But they were very um, 
very considerate, really, about it. Um, I think it's very hard, if you're not a musical family, to be able to judge somebody's musical ability, um, which by the time I was um, 17 or something, they, they did start to help me much more, help in quite often the fashion of money, of helping me to get a good guitar, um, coming to odd gigs and just showing a bit of support. But really, there, um, I think my father is more musically inclined than my mother. Um, my dad would be quite happy to turn records up very, very loud and just sort of sit there, you know, bubbling along. But my mum only listens to my records, you know, and she usually says, we don't hear enough of you these days, you know, things like that. And when, when I played her alpha, she said, well, where are you? You know, and I said, well, that's a good question, actually. And um, they, they have their own quiet way of accommodating music, but they're not... What, what, by any means, what you'd call a sort of a musical family where everybody was playing and singing and all that sort of thing. It was much more reserved. Great. In Yes, you merged classical with rock. How did that come about? Um, it was good timing with Rick coming in the band and me because we both, Rick had had some, Rick Wakeman had had some classical, um, a year or something in the music college, you know. And people usually thought that I'd had some sort of musical training, which I hadn't. Um, but I was, um, I suppose, I think part of it was just the mixture of an acoustic guitar style within the group. I usually think of Roundabout, when I asked the question you asked, about the classical influences in, in rock, uh, in Yes in particular, in the early 70s, was really the marriage that we were trying to do, having acoustic guitars involved in, in the band. I, I tend to think that's one of the things, the sort of more dramatic sort of guitar cadenza style, say the beginning of Roundabout, was much more <clears throat> classical than, than anything else. Although, musically, the ideas were really quite simple. They were more like folk bits, you know. Um, I think when Rick came in, he added a certain twiddliness to things, and lo and behold, we had some rather kitsch uh, version, um, a bit like um, the Bach uh, tem well-tempered clavic clavichord record. There was a bit of that on Fragile, uh, Brahms, Cans and Brahms or something. Uh, but I don't know whether it was in the singing, whether or not maybe there was a bit of that in Chris Squire's voice. He was a bit of a choir singer. Um, I don't know how you can relate to uh, it to percussion. So really, I would say it's most probably in the, the acoustic guitar and, and Rick's um, twiddly keyboard approach. And also, of course, we used to use the sort of church organ on a few records. Um, occasionally, we went to great lengths to get a church organ on a record, because as you can imagine, it's, uh, churches don't have recording studios built in them. So you either had to take the recording studio to the church or pipe the church into the recording studio, which we did in, um, in Switzerland once, where we, many miles away, Rick was playing the song, uh, oh, what's it called? I think it's called Parallels. And Rick was playing it while we were actually playing it about three miles away in the studio. That story's, not the first time that story's been told, but it's the sort of thing that we were doing. Or you take a quarter inch tape into, you know, a Revox or something into a church, record the organ part, and go back in and mix it into, uh, like we did Close to the Edge. That's how we did Close to the Edge. Big organ comes in in the middle. It's a real church organ. And I suppose those sort of ideas were a bit weird at the time. And um, in some, of, some of it worked, but some of it did add the, the classical overtone to the group. You knew. I was trying to get that secret. Oh, good. Um, Steve Hackett um, popped in to see my manager and said, uh, you know, sort of, you know, he'd, he'd done uh, several, if not many, solo albums, and he was he wanted to do something that was maybe a little bit more worldly than sort of local, and. Um, Brian sort of said, well, he, do you know that Steve's, you know, he's not in Asia anymore. So um, we met up and just had a preliminary talk, much like 
you've got to, to break the ice and see if there's any common ground. And um, we both felt like doing a group without keyboards, which is what we're doing. And um, because I haven't done a group like that since um, 1969, and in a way it gives guitarists more scope and freedom not to have the sometimes blanketing effect of, of multi-keyboards in, in the band. So although I've worked in that environment happily for, for some time, I am uh, quite like a double guitar idea. Uh, I think there's things that Steve and I can do for each other which are deservingly right, befitting, if you like, for us to do for each other. And, um, gives me scope to do, uh, I always felt I was quite a powerful electric rhythm guitarist and you know the choppiness that I can add. Steve's got a, a lyrical uh, approach, we can swap that round, we can uh, explore if you like the guitar area a little bit more deeply together and um, the projects come together quite comfortably and uh, it's definitely getting more and more exciting each day. Little things keep happening. Um, we, we're trying musicians out. We've, uh, in secret, we have uh, an excellent young new singer to spearhead the group, because it's not going to be an instrumental group. Um, I think that'll be a little bit indulgent, but I think maybe through this group, we can start to introduce the guitar instrumental area again and hopefully move on to that, perhaps later. Um, but the basic premise of the group is no, no keyboards, uh, no hogwash, no hard sell, just uh, some internal friction going on in the group, the right kind of friction, not the anti sort of negative friction, but the, a good guitar um, project, really, that's more more of a uh, expo exposing area. So we want to be exposed a little bit as guitarists, because I think, yes, in Asia, often people say, don't you feel a bit cramped, you know, with all these people doing the thing next to you, you know? And uh, no, I didn't at the time, but now I feel like it's a really great time not to have um, any imposing sounds around, just, uh, Working on you know bass guitar, two guitars, drums, and vocals. I think it's going to be quite refreshing for us, and not to. In actual fact, what we've been talking about every day together, Steve Hackett and I, is the the guitar part syndrome. Instead of it being guitar part versus keyboard part, which has been for many years my my job, you know, to sort of try and balance sometimes with great difficulty the roles of of two potentially soloing instruments, providing one has to provide back, back up for the other, and when the song's involved, then you've got two instruments that could back up. It gets a little bit complicated. Sometimes you just literally got to stop playing. Um, so the Steve Hackett, Steve Howe project is uh, definitely uh, a new lease of life for me, and uh, since I've started it, which is over the last two or three months, my guitar collection suddenly is alive again. You know, I look at my 150 plus guitars and I think, boy, you know, these are gems, these are gems. When in a way, I suppose, being in a group with a keyboard player, it was, there wasn't enough room to look at the guitars and, and see these as my uh, tools. You know, they were more like a collection I had at home for my own amusement, you know. And, but now I see them coming out much more into the group itself. And also, it means that Steve and I uh, have much more freedom writing, and there won't be so many egos struggling for, you know, for, for the credit or, in fact, the money. But there'll, there'll be more of a, I think, an honest appraisal of um, the best of what we do, because he's sort of picking the best of what I do, and I'm picking what the best of what he does, which, is a very nice, shows you a very nice side to a partnership. It's not as crowded as four or five people, all demanding and attempting to get a sort of an equal balance. Um, because this group is going to be basically him and me, um, with some young, younger guys to sort of 
help maintain a fresh approach because we want the music not to be well, basically, in a word, predictable. We don't want this to be a predictable arrangement. Uh, we want it to be uh, something different. Great. And finally, the awful question. Can you sum up Steve Howe in three <laughs> sentences? Because that's what we do. Five foot ten. Eyes are blue. <laughs> now let me think. Um, Okay, Steve Howe in a few sentences, not, not too easy. Uh, maybe one sentence would be easy. <laughs> no, guitarist, uh, guitarist extraordinaire. Um, potentials, many, many potentials hidden, you know, like my hurdy-gurdy playing, my dancing, all these things totally hidden. And I didn't even get a chance to dance in um, Asia videos. Uh, now, let's start again. Um, well, to answer that question, what is, who is, and how is Steve Howe, I would just say what I'd like to be remembered for, um, you know, when I'm walking down the street when I'm about 80 and somebody says, isn't that the guy who used to play guitar in those bands in the 60s, 70s, 80s, and perhaps 90s? I would, uh, I'd like to be remembered as an uh, individual guitarist. That's always what I wanted to be, individual. The, you know, very important, that, because... I think um, it's not that I want to stand out from the crowd like a sore thumb, because I don't think I do, but I wanted to uh, be my own style of guitarist, because what I liked about other guitarists was that you could identify them. So I even if a few people can say, you know, without even knowing it's me, they can hear it, that is the greatest compliment, because that's what I can do with Segovia, I can do that with all the great guitarists. I don't have to know it's them, I can, I can tell it's them. That's the greatest compliment you can pay to a musician, or maybe even the singer, you know, take Caruso, take Robert Teer, you know, take Peter Pierce, the great singers of the world, you know, Robert Plant, John Lennon, you know, I mean, you don't, somebody doesn't have to tell you. So that's a great thing. Uh, back to me, Steve Howe. I'm, I'm a family person, so I'm, it's very important to me that the people I love most, you know, know who I am and, and I get time with them. So I think in a way I'm a 50-50 uh, person. I'm 50% I'm into my career because I've always been career conscious. But also um, some questions I got asked in the early 70s were like, well, how, how, how can you have a family and be in a rock band? It's not difficult. You just have to put your foot down now and again and say, I will be available to my family at this time. Instead of the usual criteria in music business is being available to the act, being available to the record company, or you know, like being available at 11 o'clock today to do this. That's great. Let, I, I always want to keep doing that, but as long as um, I never lose sight of the importance, personal importance to me, of my three children and my wife. Great. That's fantastic. Good. <laughs>